Yes. Are we on broadcast? Yes. Uh, so um, our quiz AI seminar series continues today with a very distinguished speaker, Catherine Hill, uh, who is a professor of uh, um, medical genetics at UBC, University of British Columbia. Actually, he's a graduate of Polish University. He got his BS and MS degrees from Welsh University in electrical engineering law once upon a time. And then he got his PhD also from Welsh University, but this time in physics. And then, so it's a, a bit of a complicated story, but uh, I think I'll, I'll think when I manage it. So then he moved to US um, and he had there several research positions, first in finding Fraser University and then you do know the technology, more or less, yes. And before joining UBC, and there he's a, uh, uh, now it's a shortcut, and where he's a um, professor at the Department of Medical Genetics, uh, UBC again. Um, and he's also affiliated with several other departments and labs, and in particular the computer science department, right, in UBC. UBC. And also, he's having two different labs uh, with some complicated names. Uh, so he's having uh, first this bioinformatics lab, namely bioinformatics technology lab at Canada's Michael Smith Genome Sciences Center, UBC, right? And then he's also having uh, a web lab, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which is namely at UBC again, which is namely antimicrobial research lab at the British Columbia Center for Disease Control. So his, uh, um, his research is in large is on bioinformatics at the interface of high performance computing and biology, right? And one of his research, recent research interfaces on this antibiotic resistance. And then that's the topic of today's talk. Um, and uh, what he's doing is actually kind of interesting is that he is, uh, he, he tries he is trying to combine theory and practice of so these he discovers these new biomolecules and new data generation antibiotics in his bioinformatics lab using computational techniques like sequence modeling, AI techniques, machine learning, deep learning, uh, and then uh, he validates his findings in the web lab he's having. And more is he recently started a, a company, mm -hmm. right, to commercialize his findings for these new generation antibiotics. Supposedly, um, that would serve as a, as alternative to these common conventional antibiotics, right, mm -hmm. which is kind of problematic in the days. So, okay, so this is uh, my introduction, mm -hmm. and now uh, the stage you. is yours, Inanj. Yeah. Jump. Yeah. Please go. Ahead. Yeah, thank you uh, for the uh, invite, and it's a yeah, pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, can people on online uh, hear me? So if I just stand here and, and, and talk from, from this. Yes, so it's so any complaint? No, no, no. no. Okay. All right. Yeah, th thanks for, uh, for being here uh, physically and, and virtually. Uh, Today, I'll be uh, talking about uh, mining genomic resources uh, to uh, find novel uh, antimicrobial peptides. So, uh, before I uh, start, uh, I will do uh, my disclosure. Uh, I am a founder and chief scientific officer of a uh, company uh, developing antimicrobial peptides as alternatives to, to antibiotics. So, my, my talk is going to be related to that. And I have the conflict of interest management plans both with uh, the cancer and, and the University of British Columbia. Uh, I would also like to uh, make a land acknowledgement. Uh, I acknowledge that I uh, work and live on the unceded uh, territories of the Coast Salish peoples, uh, including uh, uh, Salutus, Squamish, Stolo, and the Masquoyan. All right. So, uh, why should you listen to this talk? Right. Um, the uh, reason why, so, so, so I will first start with a yes, scare, okay? I'll, I will scare you, 
and then I'll uh, talk a little bit uh, about the biology and then uh, do a sharp uh, turn turn uh, left uh, towards uh, AI and how we are using machine learning methods to uh, to find some some novel stuff. And I will uh, finish off with with biology. All right. So starting with the biology. Um, there, there was this, this recent uh, study published in, in the Atlantic um, uh, indicating that uh, uh, there are uh, uh, 4.95 million deaths uh, in 2019 related to uh, antimicrobial resistance. So that is uh, the uh, uh, antibiotics that, that we are taking are not uh, curing us. Right? And, the, and the global uh, burden is uh, quite high and it changes from uh, from bacterial to pathogen to bacterial pathogen and from uh, from antibiotics to antibiotics uh, but uh, there is uh, some some really uh, scary stuff right here so uh, for example this uh, acinetobacter humani uh, is uh, also known as a uh, hospital bug and uh, the uh, the carbapenem uh, resistance to, uh, to that uh, that bug is uh, is quite rampant and, and Turkey as you can see is in the Red zone, uh, meaning uh, over 80 percent of the isolates uh, that are inactive are resistant to, to this particular uh, antibody. All right. Like, okay. So, how does uh, antibiotic uh, resistance emerge? It emerges uh, whenever we use antibiotics. Okay. So, it's uh, not only about the poor use of antibiotics, overuse of antibiotics, although uh, they are. Uh, factors, uh, but it uh, evolves every time and evolves quite fast. So, so there is this um, um, inspiring uh, study from the Harvard University from uh, Kishoni lab uh, that uh, starts uh, with this uh, mega uh, petri plate uh, experiment, right? So it's a, a four feet by two feet uh, construct, and uh, what they do is uh, they uh, fill this. Uh, uh, plate with a growth medium, all right, and there are some uh, some sections going from uh, from outside in. Uh, you have only growth medium at the edges, and the next section over has a one MIC of antibiotics. One MIC meaning minimum inhibitory concentration, so just enough dose to uh, to kill the uh, uh, the pathogen of interest, right? So I believe they are uh, they are working on E. coli here. Yeah. And then the next section over has 10 times that antibiotics, and then 100 times. And the, the middle section has thousand fold uh, dosage of that antibiotics that can kill uh, the wild type um, uh, uh, bacteria, right? And they start, uh, they, they um, uh, inoculate uh, the, uh, the edges. The uh, bacteria would, uh, would just eat up the resources. Uh, just multiply in there and reach the strongly and stop a little bit as it's thinking. And then it uh, finds some uh, or evolves uh, some, some mutations. It uh, uh, collects some, some mutations to, uh, to break into that region. And then it does it again, again, and again. All right. So you can see that there are multiple paths for, for antimicrobial resistance to, uh, to tolerate. 1,000 fold uh, uh, drug concentrate, right? And it does that, take a guess, uh, within a couple of weeks, all right? So, so there is uh, there is really some uh, some scary stuff here, um, and and uh, we are going to have to come back to this um, uh, to, uh, to to see how uh, we can we can replicate a, a study like this. All right. And this slide is taken taken from the uh, the government of UK's uh, website. It is indicating the uh, the date of discovery and the date of uh, first resistance identified against some um, some classes of uh, antibiotics. All right. So uh, here we have the penicillin uh, discovered in the 1928. The uh, the first uh, uh, resistance was uh, observed in 1940. Right. And uh, some of them are uh, happening in, in almost instantaneously. All right. Um, another uh, scary stuff here is 
since 1986, since Dr. Meissen in 1986, there are no new class of antibiotics that are approved for, uh, for um, uh, use in clinics, all right? And I will add uh, one more uh, antibiotics here, and that's uh, colistin, uh, which was uh, again discovered in the early 1950s, and the emergence to uh, the colistin was first of work in 2015. Uh, now, colistin is a uh, kind of a different animal, all right? It's not uh, a conventional antibiotics, conventional small molecule antibiotics, but it is a, a molecule called a, a um, uh, polymixin, right? So uh, to, to be uh, precise, polymixin E. Um, what polymixin is, is a um, um, protein, uh, uh, I guess, a small protein uh, particle, all right, a type, right? And it is uh, known that uh, antimicrobial resistance to um, Antimicrobial peptides, those uh, those peptides that can uh, you know, work as antibiotics, that happens, that occurs uh, much much later, right? So that's to to our advantage. Um, and humans are not the only animals that use antibiotics, all right? So there's this uh, this nice uh, nature picture uh, from uh, the uh, Vancouver Island. From Swan Lake Nature Sanctuary, where I took the, uh, the picture from uh, CBC News website. Um, a, a photographer, uh, Tony Austin, took this picture uh, with this crow um, engaging in an activity called anting. Can you see the ants uh, crawling on the uh, on the body of the animal? So it is inviting those ants on, on the body, all right? The, the thinking is, the, the hypothesis is that the, uh, the animal. Uh, has some skin infection, and it is inviting those those ants to to crawl on it and to deliver something, antimicrobial peptides. All right. So uh, the uh, the animal is is taking the uh, the, uh, the antibiotics uh, topically, so uh, on it, on its on its skin, and then of course it eats the uh, the ants, so so it, it is also uh, taking it uh, or right. Okay, so, so that's uh, inspiring. Uh, there are uh, several different uh, kinds of uh, antimicrobial peptides. Uh, they are usually uh, small uh, protein particles, all right? So meaning uh, between 15 to uh, perhaps 50 amino acids long. Uh, they are cationic, uh, meaning they are positively charged. And they are uh, antiphatic, uh, meaning they're um, Hydrophobic and hydrophilic uh, residues are uh, aligned in, in some uh, part of the world. Uh, about 25% uh, of uh, known uh, antimicrobial peptides have a uh, determined uh, structure, and, and they are uh, usually uh, classified as alpha helix, beta sheet, alpha beta mixed, or, or extended coil, so no form. Okay, so. How do those uh, antimicrobial peptides come to be? Uh, as with uh, anything uh, biological, it all starts with the, uh, the DNA of the animal. Uh, I'm concentrating here on the, on the animals, but uh, all living organisms do produce um, the antimicrobial peptides, but let's stick with the animals for now. The, uh, the DNA would be uh, uh, transcribed into RNA, and RNA would be translated into uh, protein, so that's the um, uh, central dogma of, of microbiology, and then it, it would get uh, some uh, post-processing to uh, to give us that uh, mature antimicrobial peptide. All right. The conventional way of identifying these uh, these antimicrobial peptides is through uh, taking a uh, I don't know maybe, maybe taking the, the ant and, and putting into a um, a, a food processor or whatever comes out, the, uh, the blender uh, has some uh, antimicrobial properties. And then you uh, go to the lab and, and try to isolate the, uh, the peptide that is responsible for it. All right. And it is time consuming and, and, and it is uh, quite costly. Uh, but of course, the information is encoded in the DNA. All right. So, so why don't we start with the DNA? That's, that's what we do. Uh, we can take the DNA or the RNA and, and we can sequence them, all right? 
and we can do some uh, post processing to assemble them into the uh, their entirety. All right, and in the assembled um, uh, genome or the transcriptome, we try to identify where those sequences are coming from or which sequences we should be looking at. And then we can do an in uh, translation of those, uh, of those sequences into the amino acid space. And then the question becomes, is this an AMP, all right? And uh, to, uh, to, to do that, we have uh, developed a machine learning model to uh, uh, give, give us that, that answer, all right? So I know what you're thinking, you're, uh, you're smiling. So, so I, I, I think you are, uh, you are thinking about, well, not 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 uh, this necessarily, but well, oh boy, would that work? All right. So I liken uh, what we are doing uh, to this this automatic back scratch by uh, Rube Goldberg. All right. So there's this uh, this this lamp. The, the curtain catches fire. The uh, the fire department comes and, and uh, you know they put some some water in, in, in the unit. This guy thinks that it is raining, reaches for the umbrella. Uh, Pulls the lever, the uh, the ball drops, the uh, the glass shatters, the uh, the pop weights of the the mama dog starts uh, dropping the cradle, and then you have your back scratch. All right, so so it's the same. All right, so so we have the sampling, extraction, sequencing, assembly, annotating, prediction, and, and and all that. And if any step in in, in layer fails, the entire back scratch your thing fails. All right, so but. That's how science works, all right? Mm -hmm. Science is always about finding the, uh, the edge of uh, things that are doable and, and trying to do it, all right? But of course, uh, after you, you do all that, you, you have to, to validate each and every step or, or trust that the, uh, the earlier steps work, all right? So, so take them at their, at their base value and, and build up on it. But the validation is, is the key here. So, so we have to, to validate uh, them for their function. And, and this is obviously for an for an international audience, uh, for Turkish audience, we have our very own professor as you can see. All right, so similar to that, we have the experiment um, interrogating some, uh, some biological condition. All right, we isolate the cells, lyse the cells, uh, collect all the, uh, the RNA, and we do some uh, some sample and library preparation like the reverse transcription reverse transcriptase here uh, to, to build um, uh, complementary DNA or DNA libraries. Uh, we put some uh, some uh, linkers, uh, adaptive sequences at the at the edges, and then we take them uh, to to uh, high throughput sequencing. And then uh, comes to the uh, the magic part, the, the bioinformatics. You can either, um, I guess. Uh, measure expression levels, uh, try deconstructing uh, those uh, those transcripts, or to uh, do some uh, some clustering or, or visualization, and, and, and we have some we have developed uh, some tools for that, like RNA glue for uh, sequence assembly and RNA swoop for um, for for visualizing it. I'm not going to go into details of those of those tools, but uh, what we did was we uh, took some uh, 37 uh, insect species and uh, 38 amphibian species. Uh, there were some uh, publicly available uh, transcriptome sequencing data uh, available out there. It was a perfect uh, use case for RNA bloom. Uh, we uh, Assemble those uh, those transcriptomes. We post-process them to uh, to discover over one thousand novel uh, antimicrobial peptides. That's what we think, but it was uh, still in our uh, imagination. All right. Uh, but uh, before uh, validation, I would like to uh, to take you through the uh, the AI uh, component of, uh, of of this enterprise. Okay. So so we have this uh, amino acid sequence. Is it uh, AMP, or is it not an AMP? And how do we know? Now, humans are sure, quite um, uh, capable of identifying or, or, or uh, classifying images. I'm sure everybody in this in this room and uh, 
visually connected. You can distinguish a cat from a dog, right? Uh, but it is quite a uh, quite a different task to, uh, to actually uh, program a, a computer to uh, do the distinction uh, for us. I mean, we not only do that, but we can all, all also say yeah, whether the, uh, the cat and the dog are uh, a, a puppy and, and a kitten, right? So, so we, we have those uh, those abilities. And how would you do that? I mean, uh, one thing we can do is uh, looking at those those uh, doggy and, and puppy uh, pictures. If the ears are down, it's a dog. If, if the ears are curved up, it's a it's a cat. Well, not quite. You, you guys have their ears up, so so they're, they're not uh, obviously cats, right? Okay. Um, well, if the if the ears are uh, are, are down, or, or if I can see the tongue, it's it's a dog. Otherwise, it's a cat. Well, sure, uh, it, it can work sometimes, but good luck if, if you encounter this guy and, and think that it's a dog, right? So, uh, I mean, not only that, if, if we go back, let's say, here for a thousand years, a, a, a picture uh, that, that was uh, taken from uh, some uh, uh, some, some wall paintings in uh, in Egypt. We can say that it's a dog, right? We, we can tell them it's a dog, and and, and we can go ten thousand years uh, BC, and we can still spot the dog in the midst of, of those uh, of those humans, right? So so there, there's some uh, some context there. Or if we uh, come to, to to our day and uh, look at the um, drawing of a six year old, is this a dog or a cat? It's a cat, right? All right. So, so it's so easy for us. It's so darn difficult for for computers. So, so how would the computers do that? Computers do that uh, based on uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of label cat and dog pictures on the internet, right? Uh, now, of course, we don't have that luxury for for anything like little pet bites because there's only a a uh, couple thousand um, identified antimicrobial peptides still working today, but, but that did, did not deter us. So, so we built this uh, uh, machine learning model called Amplify. Uh, what we do uh, with, with Amplify is we uh, input those peptide sequences we have identified uh, through our bioinformatics methods, right? Uh, we do um, a uh, uh, rudimentary representation of those uh, antimicrobial peptide uh, sequences um, uh, using a uh, one hot encoding so for about 20 uh, amino acids. We are going to uh, build a, a 20, uh, uh, it's a size 20 bit vector and, and uh, put a uh, one to, for, uh, to, to correspond to each amino acid in the head. And, and we built that uh, for uh, the entire sequence, all right? And then we uh, feed that into a, a bidirectional long short term memory uh, layer, uh, which is uh, something that is, uh, a, I guess, uh, inspired by uh, natural language processing, all right? Um, and uh, the, uh, I guess, justification behind that is uh, because the amino acid sequences have some structure that, that we would like to uh, capture. And then we have uh, the attention layer, a uh, multi head. Um, um, what does it stand for? Multi head. Uh, yeah, so, so it's, a, it's an attention uh, layer, uh, dot product attention layer. Um, and it is again inspired by natural language processing because when, when I'm talking, you are not paying attention to every word I'm saying, but uh, some words are uh, more valuable than, than others. So, so you are paying more attention to uh, certain, uh, certain words there. And then we have a, a, a context uh, attention uh, layer from on, on top of that, uh, which we are, um, a, I guess, Distilling into our output probability uh, score uh, using a uh, an activation function. All right, and the and the method is is called the amplify. All right, so would we need all these uh, these complexity? 
Um, to, uh, to answer that, we have uh, conducted a, uh, uh, an ablation uh, study. So it, it is uh, a, a manifestation of the uh, Occam's razor, all right? That is the, the parsimony principle from uh, the, the 14th century uh, philosopher. Um, so, so it says plurality should not be a positive without necessity, all right? So don't make things overcomplicated if you don't have to. Um, so how do we test that? Uh, we test that by uh, peeling layers upon layers of our model, all right? So, so we first start with um, a, a simple bidirectional LSTM model, and then build on top the, uh, the context, uh, context uh, attention, and then uh, the, uh, the multi-head um, uh, dot product uh, attention, scale dot product attention. And then finally, um, uh, all that with a uh, with, with, with an ensemble method. And, and you can see that the performance of the method improves all the time. So higher uh, values indicating better performance. How do we measure them? Uh, using uh, several uh, metrics. Uh, Accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, uh, at one score, uh, which is the harmonic mean between uh, sensitivity and specificity, and the area under the uh, um, uh, uh, receiver operating uh, uh, characteristic curve. All right. So uh, the metrics here are uh, point metrics, and then this is a, an overall uh, performance uh, measure. And then, of course, we compare it to a, a, a competing uh, method. And, and we can see that uh, we not only improve upon uh, the uh, uh, simpler uh, architectures, uh, but what we also offer from the uh, competition. All right. So, how do we uh, train, validate, uh, test these, uh, uh, this, uh, this, this model? As I said, we are um, not very deep in, uh, in the, in the annotated uh, uh, data. We only have uh, something around uh, 4,000 annotated positive antimicrobial peptides in the literature. We took them and, and we built a, a negative set that is uh, similar to the, the positive set uh, using some, uh, some public laboratories. We split them by 80-20%. All right, so, so this is uh, textbook, I guess. And then for the uh, for 80%, we uh, uh, further partition into a uh, five-fold um, uh, cross-validation um, uh, set. All right, um, so we did not stop here, all right? What we also did was, because we have uh, some thin numbers in, in our training set, uh, all annotated uh, uh, antimicrobial peptides are, are valued. So, so we don't want to, uh, to lose them, all right? So uh, when we are leaving out uh, one of those, those folds, uh, we are not seeing uh, those peptides for for training. Uh, to, to retain that, uh, we are building a, a five-fold uh, ensemble method. All right, so, so we are ensembling the uh, performance of the uh, individual. All right, so uh, yeah, I, I will skip this. Uh, you can see that we are uh, performing uh, quite favorably uh, compared to the um, um, alternatives. Uh, but I would like to also uh, spend a few words about some other aspects. Um, that I did not talk about, about uh, antimicrobial peptides. And that's about their potential toxicity. Toxicity of those, those peptides had been a, a showstopper for their translation into, into practice. Um, what we would like to do is we would like to take those uh, predicted AMPs and we would also like to predict their toxicity profiles, so whether or not they are, they are positive. For that, we built another uh, machine learning model called Temper, and uh, it, it works in uh, two schemes, if you will. 
the, uh, the, the top screen is uh, pretty similar to the uh, amplify with, with some uh, some subtle differences. But I would like to uh, to concentrate more on the on the lower branch here, which uh, builds upon a graph neural network. What happened in uh, 2021 was uh, we had a solution for a uh, long-standing uh, challenging problem on protein folding. Protein folding had been a, um, a I guess, a graveyard for, for, for careers, right? Um, and uh, in, in, in 2021, uh, AlphaFold from, uh, from Google uh, changed the game a little bit. So uh, AlphaFold was the uh, uh, was the name uh, method of the year by uh, Journal Nature in uh, predicting accurately the uh, the protein folding structures. All right, so so we are we are building on, on that. We are feeding our um, uh, AMP sequences to collapse uh, which is built on AlphaFold two, and uh, the uh, tool gives us uh, some. Uh, some uh, features that about the uh, the predicted, uh, say, x y z coordinates, the, the secondary structure, charge, hydrophobicity, surface accessibility, uh, the, the phi and psi angles, and it, our confidence about the uh, the predicted structure. And, and based on that, we uh, we build a the graph neural network, and then we uh, uh, we, we take it uh, through those uh, uh, lower layers to uh, predict. Uh, the, uh, the toxicity of our um, peptides. But uh, how do we do that? Of course, uh, from uh, from sequence to predicted structure to um, to uh, to the graph, we have to uh, make some uh, simplifications. The, the simplification that, that we're making is uh, we are uh, putting an edge between uh, amino acid residues if they are their distance in the in the period of structure is less than a, a certain um certain, certain minimum a uh, certain maximum uh, which we take to the uh, ten angstrom rate by by default. All right, so so we build our graph, and then um, don't, don't don't worry about the, what is on the left. Uh, what is on the right uh, shows the uh, the graph neural network propagation. So propagation of the uh, the internal states. Uh, of those uh, of those nodes, all right, and it's built on the um, on the on the adjacency information uh, in the inferred uh, graph neural network, all right. So so we have our uh, update equation. So so we have uh, an, an update of those, those states, and then we feed uh, those into a um, uh, an, an attention layer. Again, uh, some uh, some residues are more important than, than others, and then we uh, uh, feed that into a fully connected layer, and then output is uh, and um, is the is the is the output of a uh, an activation function. All right, so the number of positives uh, is uh, similar. All right. And, and we have a, a more or less uh, balanced um, uh, training uh, data for validation. We have an unbalanced set, and for, uh, for testing, we have an unbalanced set. And again, we, we compare our, our model uh, to uh, the, uh, the competing uh, methods, uh, but not on antimicrobial peptides because uh, there are uh, there is not enough data for antimicrobial peptides to, uh, to figure this out. What we do uh, instead is if we uh, take some uh, some uh, peptides that are known to be toxic uh, from uh, from SysProc protein uh, database, and then we uh, would uh, compare the, the performance of Panther uh, against the other ones. This is a work in progress. Uh, the uh, the tool is not ready for prime time just yet, uh, but we use it anyways. All right, so. Uh, one way here we, we use these uh, these tools, um, namely Amplify and Panther, is uh, for uh, for sequence engineering. Okay, now now we have these uh, these 
AMPs, all right? I cannot wait my price. We want to produce them. One way of um, uh, producing them from cheaply uh, might be uh, through a fermentation model. So a quick uh, we can do a very common yeast cell to express the uh, uh, the fertilized for us uh, with some uh, some linker sequences uh, or, uh, or or some adapters, uh, some uh, signal uh, domain signal in the front. But don't worry about that. We want to have these uh, these antimicrobial peptides produced. Okay, but uh, if we uh, build, for example, an, an antimicrobial peptide if we have the structure uh, for one of our uh, star candidate uh, peptides called PEGI one, uh, our our partners in the wet lab uh, told us that it starts with a lysine. And the TEV protease does not play nice with with lysine on the and, and thermos. So we have the minimum of those peptides. So they said, why don't we um, why don't we uh, uh, prepend them with, with, a, with an S or a G? Okay, so we we have uh, we have two options. Which one should we pick? It's an it's an expensive. Uh, proposition, right? To uh, uh, to try both of them. So, so which one should we try? Uh, we uh, constructed the two uh, candidate sequences with the S thirty one and G thirty one, and we asked amplifying and temperature to the way. Uh, for amplify, uh, this is a a, a log transform like like a, a decibel a transform for the uh, for the for the values. So so higher this is better. Right, and for temper, it's a probability like score, so uh, lower is better. Right, so uh, it's a, it's a probability of toxicity. And uh, when we ask amplify, amplify it tells us that D thirty one is preferable over S thirty one, and, and luckily that uh, temper thinks the same. So it is uh, again a, a highly confident um, antimicrobial peptide. And it is uh, also predicted not to be toxic. All right. And if when we look at the predicted structure of those uh, those alternatives, we cannot tell uh, much definitely. All right. So, so we are going for okay. And how do we validate the uh, the back structure? We validate them uh, using a, a protocol called antimicrobial susceptibility testing. Uh, what we do there is we uh, build a uh, 96 well uh, format uh, experiment where the uh, the columns uh, up to here uh, represents a, a gradient for antimicrobial peptide concentrations uh, going uh, from 256 micrograms per, per milliliter all the way down to 0.5, half in all the time, right? And then we have the, uh, the positive and the negative control of uh, wells uh, in, in uh, columns 11 and 12. And on the rows, we have different antimicrobial peptides. Uh, when we have clearance uh, in those rows, it indicates bioactivity. It indicates that there is some inhibition of the growth for those, uh, <laughs> for those bacteria. And we uh, take uh, the, uh, the three cleared wells um, at the at the at the very uh, uh, low uh, concentration levels, and, and we incubate them overnight, and, and that would give us our minimum factory side of uh, concentration. So if we can have clearance in those incubated um, uh, wells, we we say that we have a factory side of uh, action. So, so we uh, measure minimum inhibitory concentration and minimum uh, factory side of concentration for those peptides. All right, so that's about uh, bioactivity. And I said, well, killing bacteria is good, killing the host is not, right? We don't, we don't want to, to, to kill the, uh, the, the animal or, 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 or the human, all right? Even taking the, uh, the, the drug. So, so we... Um, also uh, conduct some in vitro toxicity testing. Um, this is a, a protocol called the uh, Blue. Uh, uh, so it is uh, similar in construct. So, so we have uh, AMP concentrations running uh, over the, uh, the columns. 
pink, pink is good. Pink is live. Pink is uh, healthy. All right, healthy cheek. Blue, blue is bad. Blue is bad. We don't want to uh, to, to kill the uh, uh, the uh, the post cells. All right. So so we test uh, the uh, potential uh, toxicity of those uh, antimicrobial peptides by using uh, liver and the, the human kidney derived cell lines. Okay, and uh, here's a, a snapshot of uh, some, some results uh, using uh, two gram negative and then one gram positive uh, bacteria. So that's uh, E. coli and salmonella for gram negative and uh, staphorus for uh, gram positive. And for, uh, for toxicity in that, in that plot, we are using the uh, porcine uh, red blood cells. So you want the, uh, the red crosses to, uh, to be on, on top of that, um, that, that plot, right? Indicating we were not able to lyse the red blood cells. Um, and for the, for the colored plots, uh, we want them to be um, uh, further down in, in concentration, uh, meaning with a, a smaller dose, we can actually uh, kill those of our bacteria. And again, uh, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Uh, it shows the uh, peptide concentration for the for the cell viability uh, experiment, if the LMRT experiment. All right. Uh, recently, uh, we have uh, published a, a series of, of articles uh, looking at it goes of uh, insect and amphibian uh, antimicrobial peptides. And uh, in, the, in the first paper, we, we showed the, their uh, YI activity and, and toxicity profiles. And the second paper, we uh, associated them with their, uh, with their uh, predicted um, their, their folding structures, right? And uh, we Observe that uh, the uh, predictive structures can be classified into, into one of those four uh, groups, uh, epidacin, uh, dragonin, uh, dragonin 2, dragonin 1, and, and migrosin uh, 2. And I will uh, draw your attention to uh, these uh, two peptides, PAL1 and uh, FC1, uh, which are uh, linear extended particles, right? And the others are, are, are alpha basins. And, and when we look at the uh, helical content of our predicted peptides and their um, um, a bioactivity indicated by the, the size of the, the glyphs uh, there, right? We can see that for uh, program negatives, the E. coli and salmonella, uh, we, we have some uh, highly active ones that are more of the helical and, and some extended coil as well. But the, the story is uh, uh, slightly different for uh, Staphorus, uh, which is a, a gram positive. The, uh, the expanded coil uh, peptides do not uh, uh, display any, any activity. So that's uh, one of the main findings of our um, latest publication. All right. So back to, uh, to, to that uh, Tishon lab experiment on, on the mega plate. Well, we don't have a mega plate. Uh, what we uh, replicated uh, uh, in, in, in that study uh, was using a 96-12 format uh, so-called passage experiment. So, so we uh, expose your, your bacteria uh, to what uh, those antimicrobial peptides, take whatever is, is not killed, and expose them to antimicrobial peptides. Again, take what is not killed and, and and then send you for uh, for a duration of 10 days. All right. So, so why are we doing this? Because we want to, to develop new uh, antimicrobial peptides as alternatives to existing antibiotics. What is wrong with anti uh, antibiotics? What is wrong with antibiotics is when you uh, expose bacteria to uh, to uh, the drugs, they develop resistance. We don't want that to uh, happen, right? So we want to select antimicrobial peptides that are not inducing resistance in their targets, right? Or, or uh, not, not in, in, in short term periods. So uh, here is a, a set of uh, passage experiments for a uh, list of antimicrobial peptides uh, from uh, here down. And then we have 
uh, comparisons to uh, the three uh, conventional antibiotic spread uh, indicated by the, uh, the, the dash curve. And we also have cholesterol, which is uh, sitting somewhere between uh, antimicrobial peptides and, and conventional uh, small molecular antibiotics. So look what is happening here. For antimicrobial peptides, the effective concentration, that is the minimum inhibitory concentration, does not change over the course of 10 days. Right? For conventional antibiotics, it shoots up uh, 8 to 16 fold. So, so you have to administer 8 to 16 fold more drugs to, uh, to kill the same uh, bacterial strain or the evolved bacterial strain. And the story is uh, somewhere in between for cholesterol is expected. And uh, remember power one with the linear coil from the, uh, the, the, the structure prediction, it, it is up right? So the, uh, I guess, uh, moral of the story here is, if you are developing an antimicrobial that is alternative to conventional antibiotics, stick with alpha helices. Don't go to uh, linear coil. But of course, that's an N of one, right? We have to uh, repeat the, uh, the the experiment for for other uh, linear coils. But it is very indicative, and uh, although I'm not showing the results there, uh, the, the story is pretty much uh, the same for FC one, uh, which is also an, an extended coil. All right. Now, antimicrobial peptides. Um, oh, okay. So, so before that, uh, so what is happening here? What is happening is uh, this is a, a naive uh, E. coli cell under uh, transmission electron microscopy uh, uh, image, right? And uh, we we have a one day exposure to uh, power one and ten day exposure to uh, power one. And what we are observing is a thickening of the of the cell wall, right? And it's it's not uh, the uh, the same for a, for an alpha helix uh, fairly poor there. And and, and and yes, uh, the uh, the cell looks uh, fader, and it's not a um a, a, a one-off or uh, because of the uh, exposure time of, of this, this image, uh, they do uh, lose their um I guess innards. But to what when when that exports to a particular port. Only then to one more than you. Okay. All right. So so I will uh, uh, wrap up here. So so who gives the uh, who, who gives any any money, any funds to what uh, to do this work? It's uh, quite difficult to uh, to get funding for uh developing anti antibiotics for humans, right? It's it's notorious, right? Uh, what we what we were able to uh, to do was chickens first. We, we're 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 out there uh, trying to cure chickens first because uh, it's an easier target because uh, the uh, the biology of the animal is uh, easier to, to work with. So if we cure the chickens, so maybe we can we can get some uh, some money to uh, do something for uh, for humans. All right. Today we have uh, investigated uh, some uh, 518 of uh, such um, antimicrobial peptides, and, and we are uh, moving from uh, in vitro uh, experiments against some uh, uh, some panel of bacteria to more challenging bacteria to uh, the cell toxicity arrays, and eventually to, uh, to animal experiments. Uh, this uh, this uh, work was brought to you by you know, letters A and then P. And a, uh, a bunch of uh, people from uh, the, uh, the machine learning side, uh, also a wet lab uh, side, and, and uh, the name is uh, my right hand in the lab, uh, keeping things afloat. And uh, these are my, uh, my collaborators on the, on the project. The, uh, the project name is Spectate, and Spectate is a different consortium uh, with, with many, many you know, more people across um, four or five uh, institutions. And then we have a, a lively uh, and user advisory board that are guiding us uh, in, in, in this in this endeavor. 
So I will stop here. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to entertain any questions. Well, have you started with these chicken experiments? Not yet. We have. Um, we have started with the chicken experiments. Um, not on the commercial side, uh, not, not on the uh, academic side, but on the commercial side, we have. Uh, we exposed uh, one week old chicks to uh, a Teddy one, that mm -hmm. is Teddy B, Teddy B, yeah, uh, And uh, we were uh, hoping that they would like their day water because the, uh, the water is laced with the liquid prosacum of the peptides. They drink it, they are mm -hmm. fine, mm -hmm. they, they live, they, they are exposed to uh, some bacterial challenge, and then they seem to be uh, doing well. And it's still delicious. <laughs> that we have not tested. Soon. <laughs> so, okay, I need that. Next year, 2023. White chickens? White chickens. <clears throat> All right. So, because there is a history also that we cannot eat animal chickens because they are, you know, exposed to so many antibiotics and so on. Is that yeah. Yeah. Motivation. Mo motivation. <laughs> so uh, antibiotics uh, used for animal farming is, is being banned. It is banned in Turkey, it's banned in the EU, it's banned in Canada, US. Not in China, not in India, but uh, it, it, it is being banned uh, across, the, uh, across the world, right? So the uh, the farmers uh, need some some alternatives to conventional antibiotics. Why not the uh, cattle? Why chickens? Because chickens live short lives. Anyway, right? the, uh, the the broiler chicken lives um forty two to forty five days. Sad. Um, so they don't have enough time to to accumulate any adverse effects uh, through uh, long exposures to antibiotic uh, antibiotics. If there is any, we don't know. But uh, that, that's one of the justifications there. And, and they are small, so they need the lower doses. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. Actually, I have no background in antibiotics except from taking them. <laughs> uh, but I'm working on nature language processing. Mm -hmm. So the architectures you have shown seems like from five years ago to me. And I was wondering, uh, are you planning to catch up with the AI literature? And but you know the scaling knows, and you need billions of probably sequences. So that's my first question. And second question, we still ask in NLP is, does structure really help? Like, shall we just feed the models with just free text, or shall we, for instance, use graphs or trees to represent sentences, for instance? So this is still an active research area. So I was wondering if, what do you think about whether structure would help or we would just keep working with free text? So, so two, two very good questions. Um, for, for question number one, I'm a user of, of AI. I'm not an AI researcher, right? So, so uh, therefore, it, would benefit us uh, quite uh, quite a lot if if, if we were uh, into uh, some some collaboration in that in that room. So, so we would we would definitely benefit from the latest technologies, SAS and, and, and all that. So so uh, we we're not even trying to keep up with the with the plain literature. Now the question is, do you have enough data? Uh, do, do we have enough data? So so uh, that ties into your second question. Uh, the, the simple answer is no, we don't have enough data, right? Because uh, the available uh, labeled antimicrobial peptides are only 4,000, 5,000, or 8,000 if you relax your conditions a little bit. 4,000 is not deep enough data uh, to, to do deep learning, right? So, so uh, let's, let's uh, park it on the side uh, for, for a moment. Uh, on, the, on the other side, about the uh, graph structure, or if, if the graph structure is, is going to help. Uh, we did do an ablation uh, study for, for the Cantor model. So, so we, uh, we looked at uh, using sequence only or, or using graph neural network only. And, and yes, uh, if we use both of them, it is helpful in, in getting better performance. Uh, 
So, so let's uh, take it from the park. Um, we don't have enough data, but what we do have is the, is the predictive structure. So uh, just like in the earlier days of, of cat and dog images, and, and, and Nigel would be uh, quick to uh, point out to the, uh, the earlier challenges of uh, uh, pattern recognition or, or, or image uh, classification, uh, there are some, uh, some certain techniques uh, that can be applied if you have a, a graph structure. Like for example, the, uh, uh, the, the answer should not change if we translate coordinates. Or, or if we rotate the, uh, the protein, right? The, the protein is uh, still the same protein. So there are some uh, some uh, good things you can do with a, with a graph structure if you uh, if you allow uh, or if you enrich your training and, and validation and testing data by uh, doing some uh, some tricks like that. You mean data augmentation? Data augmentation. Okay. Thanks. Uh, you're limited with this uh, data set, which is of size 4,000, and there is no possibility that you, you will have more data for this problem, except maybe data augmentation. Data augmentation is uh, something we are uh, we're thinking very uh, uh, critically about. Uh, the enrichment of data, so, so having more labeled data, would, would only come if, if we have uh, more assets from. Um, from these guys, right? And, and this was a, a combination of three years of work. Mm -hmm. right? To uh, to give you some some context, uh, the uh, the four thousand figure in the literature uh, is the uh, grand total of um, some eighty years of research. Right? Mm -hmm. So, antimicrobial were discovered before penicillin. So in, in 19, uh, well, 1910, 1920, uh, that, that uh, time frame, right? Well, so, so it's 100 years, right? So for 100 years, we were able to identify and annotate 4,000 antimicrobial peptides. In only three years, we added 500 more. So, so the list is, is getting bigger, uh, but not as fast as uh, as, as you, would, uh, you would see from the, uh, the explosion of the data in the internet. And are these are sequences with fixed pattern, right? There are no variations of these. So when you say one of these, it's something fixed with no variations at all. Uh, what, what do you mean by variations? I mean, variations in the sequence, but still the same peptide, or I don't know. Or... Yeah, so so, so uh, that, that's, that's a very good, uh, good point. Um, we have... Uh, we, we have some some base peptides, all right? So so the pink ones are the uh, uh, natural ones, and the and the green ones are the ones that have been perfect. In the hope of uh, making them, them more potent mm -hmm. or or shorter, but uh, these are uh, mutated ones. So we took uh, one amino acid and, and changed it into, into something else. This column uh, represents uh, truncations. Right. So, so we have some in, in the rocket series that we truncated to see if the, uh, if the functionality holds. And then we have some, some modified ones. If the modified ones are um, quite a different uh, category because uh, they uh, include some uh, unnatural uh, uh, amino acids like um, uh, DAP and DAP. And, and other uh, side chain modifications and, and things like that. So uh, I don't know about the value for the, the machine learning model, but uh, yes, we, we do have some uh, substance variations in the mix. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, are the mechanisms the same for the antibiotics and the peptides? And, uh, and why don't we digest that? I mean, as host. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, no, very, very good questions. Um, we, I, I did not have a, a mechanism slide here, but the mode of action of, of uh, antimicrobial peptides are broadly uh, classified into two groups direct action and immune system mod uh, modulation. 
uh, what we are able to test in the vitro study so far are the direct acting antimicrobials. Um, what is good and bad about the antimicrobial peptides is, is um, uh, their bioavailability. So if, if we were to, to take them orally um, in, the, in their natural forms, you just digest them and, and get the um, taste of chickens or, um, or, or some more protein, right? Uh, but there, there are uh, some uh, some interesting developments in that front, uh, mostly in uh, 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 non-captivations and, and, and things like that for the delivery method. So the oral dosage of, uh, of these uh, antimicrobials is being worked on. Uh, but uh, for example, cholesterol is being delivered uh, um, uh, through injection. And, and there's, um, uh, I guess, immune system modulation is only possible to observe when, when we start the organic process. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, it was very uh, interesting and uh, significant things about antimicrobial peptide development but exciting for me. Uh, so in our sample, infectious disease sample, I mean, have to directly of infectious disease sample at university. We are now working with some city bus. So we are conducting uh, nationwide studies and about uh, the last situation about antimicrobial resistance in Turkey. And unfortunately, Turkey is one of the worst countries the world about the uh, resistance and antibiotic consumption, unfortunately. So, for example, resistance rates uh, against uh, Asmopactar Bauman against Carbopenem is over 95%, unfortunately. And we have growing cholesterol resistance problem, which is about 30%, unfortunately. And we have growing cell positive monobacter, one of the latest antibiotic problem in Turkey, which is about 30%. And we have growing secondary cold resistant problem against, uh, it is one of the latest antibiotic, unfortunately, it is about 30%, right? So the reason of that is the uh, uncontrolled use of antibiotics in Turkey. And unfortunately, the bacteria, they are very smart. They have very good adaptation, you know, of uh, 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 strategies uh, with antibiotics. You should uh, show up in one of your slides. Uh, before that. <coughs> and then I look at that picture. Did you test the, the standard strains or did you test, for example, cardiopenem resistant cholesterol or? Uh, cholesterol resistant cholesterol uh, in your antibiotic peptides, or are these only standard peptides? Because we know that they they are very smart. Mm -hmm. And also, the second question is, what is the target of these antibiotics on the cell? Is this cell membrane, cell wall, or protein synthesis? What is their target? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, so so that, thank you all uh, all interesting uh, questions. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, no, no, I I think I think that's uh, that's spot on uh, yeah. about the medical problem. Um, the uh, first the uh, first three here are are garden variety non pathogenic uh, bacteria. Right? So so they are the five strains of of E. coli, yes, staph, and salmonella. Um, but but of course uh, because this is a veterinary uh, uh, drug project, uh, we are also a veterinary the alien pathogens E. coli mm -hmm. and uh, Salmonella and the Okay, uh, so so they are uh, of interest to the uh, uh, to the, uh, the chicken farming uh, community. Uh, but we have also tested these uh, these um antibiotic peptides and I'm trying to. Uh, identify here, for example, the uh, MDM strain. Okay, so, 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 so that, that's a key uh, oh, okay. uh, 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 We also have uh, some Klebsiella. Um, uh, we can have the cholesterol resistant E. coli here. Right? 
Uh, this is a clip CLI. I think. Um, I don't have the um, screen number name, but yeah, this is a the hospital screen, mm -hmm. and, and it is uh, resistant to um, it, it does it does indicate the uh, multi drug resistance, uh -huh. uh, not against the cholesterol, but uh, to uh, to the other uh, uh, other other um, uh, Antibiotics. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to uh, identify here. For example, this, this uh, Salmonella Heidelberg mm -hmm. is again a, a multi drug is like very simple. Uh, what we are uh, happy to see is uh, when we test these uh, AMPs mm -hmm. against those multi drug resistant bacteria, we see that they are green. Mm -hmm. So they, they respond almost with the same way. As the as, as the um, non pathogenic uh, strains, the um, mechanism of action uh, we are only beginning to uh, look at the uh, mechanism of action. Uh, but uh, because these are direct acting, and, and because a, the majority of them are alpha helices, the uh, common understanding in the literature is that they are. Uh, uh, they, they act uh, through um, uh, through the, uh, the membrane, through destabilizing the membrane of, of these cells. Uh, for uh, Apollo 1, which is an extended coil, uh, is, uh, is thought to be um, going through the cell membrane and, and interacting with the uh, uh, plus box. Um, and, and, and that's why the thickening of, of the cell wall is, is keeping them out or, or, or perhaps rejecting them out. Uh, the uh, benefit uh, of, of, of that, that, that is interacting with the cell membrane as opposed to going inside the cell, is, uh, uh, well, it, it means that they are not interacting with the DNA or the RNA. So they are not causing uh, oh, mutagenesis, yeah. right? So, yeah. so if, if you are enable, if, if you are disabling the, uh, the mutagenesis, mm -hmm. then bacteria are not going to evolve as, as a response to it. Not as fast. Yeah. Uh, maybe by changing the option of the five layers, uh -huh. uh, but uh, not uh, through, uh, through some, yeah. some 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 other um, right. Uh, coming back to uh, the colostrum for a uh, for a minute. Uh, colistin was uh, a, a shelf drug for, for, for the longest period of time, right? Because it, it was uh, thought to be uh, toxic and, and it was only limited for, for use for, say, uh, uh, cystic fibrosis uh, patients uh, for some um, uh, multi drug resistant uh, uh, urinary tract infections. And, and some uh, some very particular uh, infections as a drug of last resort. That, however, did not uh, prevent uh, farmers from using it, mostly in China and in the EU. So China was the was the biggest producer of colistin, and EU was the biggest customer of colistin. They can use it extensively, and unfortunately, uh, colistin resistance is, is emerging as a, as a problem. Uh, we well, have from the chicken farms, essentially. Especially in, in chicken farms. Uh, but we have tested our uh, AMPs against cholestin resistant um, uh, bacteria, and, and they are not need to uh, for our AMPs as well. So, so there is hope, mm -hmm. uh, but we have to be very careful in developing these. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, flax farms also bacteria. They are really you know, they have high capacity to control the response. Mm -hmm. So we saw we are doing some projects that they you know they increase the uh, trans uh, the expression of the response point that we do. But maybe other mechanisms as I saw the, the thickness of the cell or maybe some mechanisms in the cell also mm -hmm. is activated by the Thank you very much. It's very, very, very you know, uh, exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the questions.
Isolates means no variation on the no, data. No, no, no. You mean that the variation is occurred. Yes, yeah. that's why we increase the repeated testing. We add, so you get variation or you, no, no, you know, increase the variation, increase the variation. Adding the more samples, more repeated experiments. And so, your yeah. pool, your pool included, including the repeated experiment or just the separate isolate sequence? Yeah, yeah, that was a good, good question. Um, What we would be here very careful, what we should be very careful about is uh, overtraining uh, our models. Right? So, so that's why uh, using the, uh, the training data, UIC is, is very important. Uh, you wouldn't want to um, memorize the, uh, the 4,000 sequences, mm -hmm. right? But, but you would want to, to get the, the essence of uh, what it means to be an animal. So that's the, uh, the, uh, the the abstraction that, that we are trying to get out of uh, the, the set of four counts. Uh, what we are doing uh, is uh, we are actually dividing our, our training set into multiple parts. Mm -hmm. I, I do also, but uh, maybe I, I went to, uh, too, too fast though. But uh, what we are doing is uh, we are partitioning that, that training set into five parts. And, and we're training a model using the, using four of those five mm -hmm. and, and validating on the paper. And then you can do it uh, at five times over, leaving out one of those, those five partitions, mm -hmm. right? This is called the cross-validation. Uh, cross-validation is good, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, your each and every training has actually seen a different set of uh, high price to uh, Get this uh, uh, the, the machine learning model uh, parameters uh, trained, right? Um, so, in a sense, uh, they are seeing different peptides, or, or they are seeing different types of peptides to build that, that model. That's why we are ensembling all those five, uh, and, and, and we are uh, trying to, um, I guess, uh, do some uh, some augmentation that way yeah. by, by ensembling those four models. Is that the best way of doing it? Uh, probably not. So, so, so we will have a different way of discussions around how best to do it. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm sure that, that there must be other uh, like clever methods uh, that, that, that we can employ there. But we are sort of very uh, data hungry, and, and that uh, data hunger is not going anywhere. But we can even if we can include 500 more. Like, what, what would be a good number for a for a model to train? I also did a lot of studies on data augmentation. Actually, Turkish and languages like morphologically rich languages are free word order, so I can do variations on the order of the words. Mm -hmm. But uh, from experience, when you are working on low resource languages and low resource data, augmentation only helps until a point. Um, and I think we need more data. Even augmentation will not solve the problem yeah, yeah. from my own experience. When, when you take those NMAT, whatever, the known ones, mm -hmm. so when you take that sequence, any instance of it, it's always has exactly the same structure. The same sequence, not the same structure. The so, so the structure, a peptide uh, or the protein structure, has some very other thing. But the sequence, for, for a given AMP, it has a particular sequence. Okay. So, so one sequence, one AMP. So maybe related to that, uh, the structures that you showed, uh, what are they based on? Like, um, 
most likely these are very, very uh, short sequences. So on their own, I would like say thank you, have a very stable study. So the structures that you predict are, for example, that is acting as a memory, the structure inside the memory. So what is it? Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> so 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 this, this, this is a gotcha name, okay? <laughs> oh, well, he got me. <laughs> the uh <laughs> <that's an old laughs> idea. <laughs> predictive protein structure. So so what what collateral does is you give it a sequence, it spits out a, a predictive structure. It has no notion about the um uh micro environment for those peptides or, or what it is interacting with. So so yes, uh, that is still an active field of research. It's an unsolved problem. Uh, we are taking the uh the peptide uh, structures as a suggestion. Okay. So so it, it's it's not the, the real deal, but then what we are doing is if we are taking those critical structures and then we are building a, a graph in the network out of them. Is that going to be the structure of uh, when these these peptides are interacting with their target? We don't know. Is that structure going to be the structure when they are uh, in the uh, biological environment, like the, you know, the bloodstream or the or the organ or whatever? We don't know, mm -hmm. right? So uh, I I don't think that that problem is uh, solved yet. Nowhere near close, right? Uh, well, if you take the structure into account, there is this possibility of having more data, more variation. Uh, um, yes, then... absolutely, absolutely. So, so that's the the data augmentation plan, right? So, mm -hmm. if, if you have the structure, mm -hmm. you can rotate it, you can translate it, and and and, and do data. Okay, you still have the same sequence, but different data eventually, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to do an announcement. So uh, we have one on one meetings with the speaker. Uh, so if you have like if you need more time to discuss, I think we should call it <laughs> today because it's almost yes. half past 11. Yes. Uh, but if you need to discuss more, we have two more slots. Okay. So first we have John Saiba Pansaba and Yit Janotesh. And we have two more slots if you want to uh, have a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Please let us know. Okay. Then let's thank the speaker again. And we're broke.